This presentation aims at providing you with a strategy and mechanism for creating an incredible team, exceptional in every way. Today, we will show you step by step how you can do this by just applying a few simple disciplines and procedures. I'm going to provide you with a mindset and a formula that will enable you to create a team that exceeds even your wildest imagination and will transform your practice in ways you can hardly imagine right now. In other words, we're going to reveal to you all of our secrets. When my good friend Rick Schwartz heard that this was going to be my last lecture, he called and said, why don't you make it about how you developed all this stuff? And I said, no, I, I want to make it about how to create an exceptional team. But then I thought about it some more and said, wait a minute, maybe there are things in my background that if people knew about could also help them accomplish their goals. Maybe some lessons that I was very lucky to learn very early in my life that helped me accomplish many of my goals. In fact, if people understood where all these sayings that I've tortured TDOers with all these years came from, it, that might really help them. So the first section is how and why I developed a certain mindset and how I think that mindset can help you if you are able to adopt it. We'll follow that with some specific training protocols where my whole team will contribute their perspective on team building. So the topic is training for excellence. In the first 25 minutes, we'll reveal where a lot of my ideas came from and how certain sayings sustain me through moments of doubt and weakness. And then for the rest of the time, we'll drill down into the details of how to create the team of your dreams. Like everyone, my perceptions are based on my experiences. And certainly for the last half of my career, those experiences have been in mentoring others and also learning from them. I think many here may not be aware that at the end of our PERF training courses, we have met and trained almost one third of the practicing specialty and 70% of the postgraduate directors in the United States and Canada. So my experience comes from observing how people learn, how they treat and train their people, and how quickly they improve and gain new skills. It was an incredible insight into our specialty, really. I saw these people not only in a training environment at our foundation, but also in our home and in our lab and in our office. So I've had a tremendous experience in being exposed to practicing endodontists all over the world. Here, in just a three-year period of the course lectures we did, gives you a sense of how busy we were and the exposure that took place during that time. Four years ago, I made a YouTube video explaining how to train an assistant in seven days. It's had over 70,000 views highly unusual for a dental training video. But it was the comments that posted about it that were very concerning to me. Most were very complimentary and maybe that's part of the problem. Comments like, she's so lucky to have a doctor like him or my doctor just shouts at me and offers no training at all. Or this video is so inspirational. Good heavens, it's just a training video of, of how we train people. Here are some of the comments from the YouTube site. From my dental experience, a person who walks into the office without experience won't learn in seven days. Impossible. I know this because I teach DAs and also train them. The most they do is clean instruments in the operatory by the first week. But to say it's easy is a mistake. It made me realize, at least for those who made comments, the whole training environment in the dental sphere could probably use some help. Given the posted responses, what can we surmise the problem may be? Let's look at a few of them to see if there might be a clue. This is one that really got my ire. Here, someone thinks older people can't be trained. Another thinks only entry-level people are suitable. 
one hardly knows where to begin with this idiot. Conceptually, let's break these problems down into three groups. If you think something is impossible, you will never be able to create it. That is a given. In the first section of this presentation, I'm going to focus on that problem because it is the most difficult one to overcome. I've tortured TDOs with this slide for almost 20 years. Most people fail, and especially dentists, because they can't get by the first hurdle, understanding the possibility. Because dentists are detailed people, far fewer have trouble with the second and third hurdles. So let's examine the first hurdle in detail. We should all ask ourselves and then ask, why am I not accomplishing more? Why is it that people only rarely exceed 30% of their natural potential? I've used this quote from The Use and Abuse of History by Friedrich Nietzsche for many years on TDOers to try to get them to understand that it is only themselves that is the limiting factor in realizing one's dreams. So the question you always want to be asking yourself, am I limiting myself because of my understanding of what is possible. Men in cultures are limited only by their horizons, only by what they think is possible. That's the limiting factor. In 1990, when I first talked to any group for the first time about microscopes, this was always the first slide I showed. A slide designed to extend their horizon, their vision of what is possible. So always, whenever you start on a journey to accomplish something, like training an assistant or creating a great team, always start with what the end vision is and keep that always within your sight. If you recall, these were the first two slides I always showed when talking about what TDO was really about, the true ends of TDO. These are for, from Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics and they outline in purest language what all of us know intuitively, that the fulfillment you get from any activity is inextricably linked to how well you do it. It is not an opinion, it is a fact of human nature. We strive by excellence by nature. Aristotle said, happiness is an activity of the soul in conformity with virtue. For the classics, virtue was human excellence. And second, a well-lived life is the full development of one's abilities and a life affording them scale. Now, this is Mrs. Gleason's fourth grade class. I'm 10 years old here and small for my age. Mrs. Gilson told my parents that I was the most curious student she had ever had. But my parents already knew that because anything I got my hands on, I took apart, thinking I might be able to figure out how it worked. That's me, in case you don't recognize me. It is probably significant that he even looked a little like Dennis the Menace. <clears throat> Here I am reading about atomic bombs <clears throat> and how to make them. One day my dad said to me, slightly frustrated, you know, if you really want to understand how things work, you need to learn how to be able to put them back together again. I told my dad, I tried, but I never can. Then my dad said something really important. He said, well, then an even more sure way is just to build things from scratch. Then you'll really know how things work. Well, it just so happens in every popular science magazine at that time, there was this ad from a small company in San Antonio, Texas. What they sold was a series of monthly science kits where you constructed things from scratch. These kits profoundly affected my life, changed it in a way one, hard can, one can hardly overestimate, if you'll bear with me here. Not only giving me a lifelong love affair with science, but more importantly, teaching me that almost nothing is impossible. Let me elaborate. The kits arrived, one each month, each with its own instructional manual. The happiest day of the, month was, of the month was the day the American Basic Science Club 
arrived. So I'm 10 years old. I'm fulfilling my dad's request that I build things from scratch. These product projects had such a profound effect on my life. I've saved them for 65 years. They came in this little cardboard box. Every month you'd get these boxes and you'd open it up and inside were all the parts you needed to build a project from scratch. This was project number one, building a power supply. Just to give you an idea of what was in these books, today it is probably considered junior college material. In fact, during the Apollo heyday, they actually did a survey of NASA engineers, and it turns out a large percentage of the NASA engineers got their start in science with the American Basic Science Club kits. These are my parents when I was 10 years old, and these are my grandparents. My grandfather was a very well-known civil engineer, and he spent the last part of his career in Asia. He was the head engineer for many of the hydroelectric plants in Turkey and Egypt. He retired to Florida, and this picture was taken when we visited him for his wedding anniversary. That's my grandfather. He was kind of a typical engineer, more comfortable with a slide rule than actually talking to people. Of course, I brought my American Basic Science Club kit I was working on, and uh, I didn't want to talk to my grandfather. So I'm sitting there on the floor. He's, he's sitting there watching me, doesn't say anything, just watches me and then reads the paper, watches me. But one morning I awoke and had found he had written something on the back of my American Basic Science Club manual. This is what he wrote. The will to win is not nearly as important as the will to prepare to win. Forrest Evershevsky, a Big Ten football coach, said this. My grandfather wrote that in the back of my manual and I've saved it all these years and made it one of the primary TDO sayings. The will to win is not nearly as important as the will to prepare to win. It's curious, when I posted it on TDO chat, when I first posted, somebody said, oh, I know who said that. Bobby Knight said that. And then somebody said, no, Vince Lombardi said it. Well, I know who really said it because my grandfather wrote it down for me when I was 10 years old. The will to win is not nearly as important as the will to prepare to win. I saved that booklet, and whenever I had doubts about my abilities, I took it out and I repeated it over and over again to myself. I'm hoping as you train your team, you will embrace it and repeat it over and over again to your team members. In Kit 4, you build a transmitter that could send Morse code, and I learned you could actually become a ham radio operator and talk to people all over the world. All you had to do was pass a test given by the FCC that tested your knowledge of basic electronics and an ability to copy Morse code at 15 words a minute. There was actually a manual to teach you how to get your license. I thought it was incredible that I could talk to people all over the world from my bedroom. I knew I could pass the written test because the kits were exceptional in making sure you understood electronics, but I was really struggling with Morse code. So many letters. I struggled with the English language, as you can tell. So Morse code at, at uh, 15 words a minute. Practice copying the old poem, Casey at the Bat. So that's Morse code at 15 words a minute. This is my mother. I go to her one day and I said, you know, I can pass the written test to become a ham radio operator and I really want to become one, but I can't learn the code. I, it's just too hard for me. Now my mother was a really smart person. She said, oh my heavens, this is so easy. This is what you do. Number one, just learn one letter a day, just one. Every day, 
review all previous letters and practice them. On day 26, I promise you, you will have mastered Morse code. I said, really? I don't believe it, but I'll, I'll try it. What do you think happened on day 26? Thirty words a minute. So by age 10, I was already formulating how smart people functioned because I lived this. I took something I thought was really difficult and complex and mastered it easily. That lesson has never left me and has informed my entire life and approach to difficult problems. Things are easier than you think they are if you take them step by step, one thing at a time. Don't be overwhelmed by apparent complexity. So as a 10-year-old, my horizons are already being altered and there's little I do not feel that I can't accomplish if I take things step by step. I just need to take things step by step, learn one thing at a time, and I can prepare myself for almost any challenge. I've felt this way almost my entire life. Understanding the possibility, that's the hard part. I also know and made part of my mindset that dreams are possible, but only if you focus on the details. My American, my American Basic Science Club kids taught me that. Great things don't happen by accident. I think as a 10-year-old, I was so far ahead of many of my classmates in my mindset about things because I had lived this with these kids. Dream big, but focus small. I got my ham radio license, but I needed a much larger transmitter than the one that American Basic Science Club offered. The idea of communicating from my bedroom with people all over the world through the magic of radio waves just filled me with anticipation and wonder. So it turns out there's a company in Michigan that put kits together that you could make a 60 watt or 100 watt transmitter. So I saved up my money and I bought that kit and I've kept it all these years. At 12 years old, I built my own transmitter using Heath kits, just really just a small advance from what I did in the American Basic Science Club kit. This is the transmitter that I built. I've saved it all these years. I learned from the kits that the first thing you do is check to make sure every part was present before doing anything because sometimes they made a mistake in the kits and you didn't get all the parts. And when that happened, it was terrible because you couldn't complete the project. So I got in the habit of checking every part before even a s trying to do any of these assembly. So by this time, at tw I'm 12 now in learning how important checkoff lists are. Later on, I'd use that knowledge of how important they are in not making errors in forming TDO look familiar. And the advantage of this was that you did your checkoff list and you learned the names of the parts. You learned what they look like and what their, what their symbol was. I'm also getting reinforcement from American Basic Science Club kit on how important step-by-step -step procedures are. Doing things in order, in a logical sequence, without skipping sets or taking shortcuts, making errors, Look familiar to you? Connect one end of a four and a half yellow wire to lug three of terminal strip A. Place the other through the grommet B to be connected later. Connect either lead of the clear neon lamp to lug one of terminal strip A. Use three quarter inch length for sleeving. This walked you through it step by step, one step at a time. I absolutely love building things this way. It was controlled, you reduced errors. And when I first made TDO, this, these are the original plans for TDO. I wrote it down as a checkoff list. And TDO is built around this. If you go through these pages, you can see that it's, you're very unlikely to make a careless error if you go through a checkoff list. 
These are the initial creative notes in TDO. I wrote all of this down in about a week. That's all it took to really design TDO was about a week. Now, in the process, I'm learning a new language, the language of electronics, and understanding that if you want domain expertise in any field, you must share and learn a common language. Now, the common language of electronics is schematic diagrams. <clears throat> so I embrace this new language, learn its symbols and vocabulary, and develop an understanding of how powerful it is in understanding how things work. When I look at a schematic, I can trace the signal. I know what each part does. I can discover why something doesn't work, all based on a little $3 monthly kits I played with when I was 10 years old. This is me at 15, talking with people all over the world from my bedroom using the magic of radio waves. But I learned an even more important lesson here, one that has stayed with me my entire life. When you contact someone as a ham radio operator, you send each other your QSL card as a record of who you talked with. I saved these cards for over 50 years of everyone that I talked with. This is only one sheet of them. I have about 30 different sheets of all these cards. Here they are, hanging in my lab. It had such a powerful effect on me. What was this community about? Well, all we did was help each other. Having trouble with your second stage ampler, amplifier? WB2, BBJ, that's who I was, WB2, BBJ, this is what I did. All we did was help each other. It was a helping community, and all we talked about was our equipment. That's all we discussed, really, was our equipment. So I developed a sense of how powerful a community could be based on helping each other. It produced rewards that almost everyone underestimates. And when I formed my own community, of microscopic people. I had in the back of my mind how powerful this ham radio community was and what a sense of community we had because all we really wanted to do was help each other. So in, in having these people come out, we developed this community and the TDO community is like the ham radio community. All we really want to do is help each other get better. There's really no other agenda. I like this. This was a note from Michael Foreman. It's a private note, but I'm sure he won't care if I sh share it. He says, I just wanted to email you privately to know that the TDO service is great. I had a server issue this morning. My staff got up and ran. They were very kind. The culture you created is what I try to create in my office. After 14 years of practice, I still ask myself, what would Dr. Carr do? What I learned was how powerful a community could be and that when you're training, you're really building a culture, uh, a culture of helping and a culture of excellence. So at 15 years old, I had experienced this power myself, enjoyed being part of it. So when I formed my own community, <clears throat> I had this in the back of my mind. Now, most think Rob Kaufman and I are mortal enemies. I mean, he's spoken out against everything I've ever built. He was against microscopes, against taking photographs, against the draw page, didn't like CBCT wasn't necessary. I could go on and on. We've called each other terrible names, pygmy, comrade, because he's a socialist, or worse, yet we're still friends. Why? We are bonded together by both being ham radio operators. He's a ham radio operator a shared culture, shared values. I know, it's sickening, isn't it? At the root of it, we're all basically tribal. <laughs> now, the fifth kit had me building a microscope and a telescope. <clears throat> These are the pages from the book on how to build a microscope. I learned all kinds of things. They even had a separate thing on how to build a larger microscope and how to grind your own lenses. Uh, I made a four inch refractor telescope where they taught me how to grind my own objective and lenses for the scope. 
So it was just an incredible experience. I learned all about optics. Um, it had me examining biological materials. So from the time I'm 10 years old, I'm looking through a microscope almost daily. It taught me how to process specimens, how to slice specimens. There was a homemade microtome and you learned how to stain them and slice them with very simple, very simple tools. It taught you how to stain slides, how to mount them on, on, on glass slides, put cover slips over them. So all of this, uh, as a young boy, learning this, learning about science, I'm spending a lot of time at my microscope trying to figure out how life works. So when I'm in Terry Tanaka's lab and I'm doing some dissections in my 30s, I wanted to take a closer look at these. I wanted to look at them under an electron microscope. So I took these specimens down to Scripps Oceanography uh, where they had a service where you could rent time on a microscope, $250 an hour. You got to look, you had a microscope and a technician there to help you. And uh, I didn't know anything about electron microscopes, didn't realize what it took. But when you look at things under an electron microscope, microscope. It takes hours. You just can't do it in an hour or two. So I realized this wasn't going to last because it, it was too expensive. But then the technician said something very interesting. He said, you know, these big companies, they, get, they have grants or they have a project, and when the project is over, they really have no use for the scope. And if, if they haven't serviced it and it doesn't work, a lot of times they just sell it for salvage. It's broken. They, uh, and if, if you know anything about microscopes, uh, you can pick these up for practically nothing uh, because a, a working scope, uh, I asked the, the scope at, Crip, at Scripps was a one and a half million dollar microscope. I think you know what's coming next. This is my first electron microscope I brought from General Dynamics for $2,000. It's in my garage here. The reason I show this is to make the point of how your own view of what is possible affects where you can actually accomplish that. Remember that when you're training your people. Don't shortchange yourself. Now, I didn't know anything about electron microscopes, but what is an electron microscope? It's a power supply, it's an amplifier, it's a filament, it's a signal generator, a vacuum system, and a detector. It's nothing that I haven't built myself through American Basic Science Club clip. My point here is that I wasn't afraid of making a mistake. Even if I couldn't fix it, I would start on my journey and I'd learn something about how electron microscopes work. The only question I asked when I went up to General Dynamics was, when was it last working and do you have the schematics for it? So that's why I tell my son, the greatest gift you can give your children in life is how to live in this world unafraid. I was unafraid. I think most people look at this and they think, good grief, what, what a, you know, there's, so much failure uh, if this, what if you can't do this? What have happened? I wasn't afraid of this. I figured I'm gonna get this thing up and running and if I don't get it up and running, um, I'm gonna learn something about electron microscopes and maybe the next time I wouldn't make such a stupid mistake. So I got the thing up and working. I knew how to trace a signal because I had built my own signal tracer in the American Basic Science Club kit. I had built one. I knew how to trace a signal. And I, here's one of the schematics from it. Uh, I traced the signal. I got the thing up and working. And Terry Tanaka let me put it in his lab, and now I'm up and running. So I got it up and working and learned a hell of a lot about how electron microscopes work. I put it in Terry's lab. So it was just one in a long line of electron microscopes that I have obtained, all because of small wins. This concept is so powerful. 
And you need to adopt this and embrace it in your own life uh, when you're training people about how important a small win can be and how it can fuel transformative changes in your staff, in your culture, by leveraging tiny little advantages into patterns that convince people that much bigger things are possible. Here's my fourth electron microscope. Weighs three tons. I got it out of the University of Tennessee. They sold it to me for $5,000 because it was broken. Well, this is it. Now, a lot, I think a lot of people look at this and say, good grief. I don't think that way. I think, well, okay, I'll figure it out. I've got the schematics. I'll figure it out. Being unafraid in life. That's understanding the possibility, not being afraid of failure and learning how to deal with failure. I was prepared for failure if I couldn't get it working. Well, okay, I wasted $5,000, but I learned even more about electron microscopes. Again, the advantage of being unafraid in life, not fearing making a mistake. I love this statement by John Wooden, the greatest basketball co coach who ever lived. If you're not making mistakes, then you're not doing anything. I'm positive that a doer makes mistakes. Nothing could be truer. So I ask you, where does all of this lead to? Well, let me show you where it leads to. It leads to here. This scope was broken because the chilling water to cool the magnetic lenses was leaking. It wouldn't work because the lenses, when the current goes through the lenses, they heat up very fast. And if, if you can't cool them off, the machine shuts off immediately. It stays on for less than a minute and it shuts off. So I said, well, there must be something shutting this off. I wonder if the lenses are overheating. We I took the lenses out and there's these little pinholes in the lenses. Well, I know how to solder. I've been soldered since I've been 10 years old. We repaired the pinholes, put the lenses back in, and lo and behold, the thing worked. So now I have a million dollar, not only a scanning electron microscope, this is a dual microscope. This is a scanning and transmission electron microscope in my office for $5,000, a million dollar microscope. We got it up and working and these scope pictures I took up to Dr. Kosterton to show him what I was doing. So now I'm getting some really nice biofilm pictures, but I'm not really sure what I'm looking at. I'm not a biofilm guy. I call my good friend Winston Chi at USC and ask him if he can refer me to someone at USC that knows a little something about biofilms so I can start learning about biofilms. And he says, are you kidding me? The world's foremost authority on biofilms, the man who invented the science of biofilms is right next door to me. He had just transferred from USC from the Montana biofilm and I just say, God, can I come up and meet him? So I go up to USC, I take my pictures, and I meet the great one. He takes my pictures and looks through them very slowly, not saying anything. Finally, he says, where did you get these? I said, well, they're mine. He asked, well, what university are you with? And I had to explain to him, well, I'm, I'm not with a university. I, I have a... I have my microscope in, in my dental practice where I do private research. He said, you have your own electron microscope? Now, Bill Costerton was first and foremost an electron microscopist himself. He knew electron microscopy. So I told him my story about how I bought old scopes. I fixed them up and he was in total disbelief. He was not used to that kind of environment. He was used to these electron microscopes being in big foundations or universities or imaging centers because they're so expensive. They, they only go to places that has a lot of grant money and they have the money to service them. He had never seen anything at all like this. So he says to me, 
can I come and see your lab? He was very, he was very intrigued. And so it began a long journey with him and we actually became very good friends, lectured together, and he took me under his wing and he mentored me. He also introduced me to some of his circle of friends, which basically transformed my life and taught me something about how world-class science is supposed to be done. So he brings me into his circle of friends who are top, top scientists in the biofilm field. Every time he came into my, he had this expression on his face. He, every time he came, he just couldn't believe that I was able to, to do this. And I think it's one reason we became such good friends because he kind of knew where I came from. He, he knew I didn't know anything about biofilms. I just had an electron microscope and was getting some pretty darn good pictures and was, had an insatiable curiosity uh, about them. He lectured to TDOers twice before he died. I was actually the last person he talked to before he passed away. He, he called me. He, he wanted to speak to my wife. And he wanted to let me know what, his, what the relationship meant to, to him. So another TDO saying, part of excellence is being exposed to excellence. It's a funny thing about accomplished people. They're always surrounded by other accomplished people. So, um, <clears throat> Dr. Kosterton has, has stolen uh, Christoph Schadin from the Koch Institute in Germany and brought him to USC because Christoph was certainly one of the finest electron microscopes in the world and Bill had very high standards in this regard. He called me one day, he said, I want Christoph to come down and spend some time with you. And I know what he wanted to do. He wanted me to get some formal training so I knew what the hell I was doing. <clears throat> I, I never had any forming. I had, my training was from the American Basic Science Club kits. So Christoph came down and spent about a week in my lab with me. I learned so much from him. I learned all the secrets uh, about specimen preparation and how to avoid certain areas. I learned so much from him. It was a wonderful gesture on Bill's part to have him come down and spend time with me. And then we started getting some really good, really good images of, of endodontic biofilms. And uh, I was introduced to Paul Webster, another one of the finest electron microscopists in the world. And uh, I spent a lot of time with Paul. This is one of Paul's pictures. Just incredible electron microscopists and uh, confocal microscopists. So I learned about confocal microscopy as well. We published a, a couple of papers together. I learned how to write scientific papers and how good science really is, is, is done. So, uh, um, it just goes to show it's fine to dream big, but you have to focus small. So when you compare these two pictures, is this much different than this? No, it's just a difference of degree. It's just a difference of scale. And when you're training your staff, that's how you want to think. You build things one at a time and you scale it up one step at a time. <clears throat> one step at a time. So the biggest impediment to you realizing your potential is your own fear of failure. And the best way to conquer fear is to realize small wins. <laughs>